Now it's time for Toker Talk Radio, the voice of the marijuana nation. What are you people? On dope? Where you can tow. I am here. Uh, or you can talk. I experimented with marijuana and didn't inhale. Or you can talk and talk. Ten federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. While we talk about tow on Toker Talk Radio. So, by the way, when it comes to pot, you know, if you're 40 years old, you live in a log cabin in Oregon, you got 12 giant pot plants in your backyard, have a ball. Live from beautiful Potlin, Oregon at Rolla J Studios. Like Plus your calls live at 971-533-7111. They're walking on their pants with their cap on backwards, listening to the end of a man, the Snoopy Snoopy poop dog. What's to keep somebody from getting all potted up on weed and then getting behind the wheel? Gateway theory doesn't work. It's a reality. Holland, is it real? Don't tease me. We're locking up people that take a couple of puffs of marijuana, and, and the, the next thing you know, they got 10 years. And now, here's your host, the guru of Gonta Graphics, the sultan of Sativa Statistics, and the worst nightmare of a reefer mad prohibitionist. A polite, perspicacious, productive pothead with a propensity for PowerPoint. Radical Russ Belleville. Good day, tokers and tokets and non-token lovers of liberty. Welcome back. It's hour two, Toker Talk Radio, where we let what's left of my hair down, loosen the tie. As you know from our copious amount of advertising, the High Times Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam is underway. And yesterday, Sunday, they faced the new conservative backlash in Amsterdam. The Cannabis Cup Expo was forced to alter its original plan uh, at their regular location. And um, this morning, this is from yesterday morning, Sunday morning. This morning, we were informed that if we were to proceed with the Cannabis Cup Expo, the event would be shut down and all participants would be arrested. In the 26 years of the Cannabis Cup, there has never been any health or safety issues, nor has there been any lawlessness on the part of the attendees. Uh, The seminars will continue as scheduled on Monday and Tuesday. They'll announce the location of Wednesday's and Thursday's seminars in the coming hours. Concerts and the Cannabis Cup Awards show remain scheduled. It was just the big expo floor where they had problems with. um, uh, Some updates that I've read as well mentioned the authorities saying if anyone uh, is is toking, there's going to be major problems with, with, uh, uh, with the law enforcement. And High Time staff and the participants of this year's Cup are fighting back against it. But as we were speaking to Bobby Black on the Herb Thrasher Flower Hour a couple of weeks ago, we interviewed him uh, prior to this. And uh, the uh, uh, it's interesting that, you know, High Times started the Cannabis Cup. Now, High Times, of course, an American magazine, started the Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam because... Back in the 70s, that was the only place. Well, let's see, it's 27 years old, so it wasn't the 70s that they started. 90s, I guess. But whenever they started, uh, the only place in the world you could go where people could freely enjoy cannabis and and celebrate it was Amsterdam. And then, of course, you know, more events have opened up. And soon, as we passed medical marijuana in 2010, the uh, High Times Medical Cannabis Cup started in San Francisco. I was there at the first medical cannabis cup in the United States. And now it's evolved to both medical in California and cannabis cups, no medical required, in Seattle, Portland, Northern California, Southern California, Michigan, and um, Denver, Colorado. So there are now six cannabis cups going on in 2015 domestically where they're going to have far, far less problems with law enforcement than the uh, people in Amsterdam are giving them. Oh, and thanks, Electric Bob in the chat room says 1987 first cup. Thank you for doing the math for me. So yeah, six cannabis cups domestically that are getting far less hassle in the United States than the cannabis cup, the original cannabis cup in Amsterdam. And also Bobby Black told us of the possibilities of cannabis cups in New England and Jamaica. There could be eight cannabis cups. I, they didn't say anything about Alaska. I don't know if they want to do an Alaska cannabis cup, but I'd go. Shit, Alaska would be awesome. But uh, eight cannabis cups a year in the United States? 
will we see the end of the Amsterdam Cup? The, the way the conservatives are, you know, throwing their power around in, in uh, Holland these days. I don't know if the Amsterdam Cup's days are numbered or not. We'll get some reports from the Cannabis Cup. I've been reaching out to the guys out there, see if we can talk to them you know, live in Amsterdam, although uh, the time difference is kind of tricky. I think it's like one in the morning when we're doing our show, but we'll find out more for you. Also, quick update on uh, the grand jury in Ferguson, Missouri, has not announced uh, its uh, whether or not it's going to indict Officer Darren Wilson. Let me just um, tell you, they're not. <laughs> they're not going to indict the cop that shot Michael Brown. Uh, you know, we report all the time on cops that shoot dogs in their SWAT raids, right? And, and I'm not talking like pit bulls that are charging. I'm talking about corgis and doshins and chihuahuas that are running away get shot by these cops. And so long as a cop is obeying their procedure and feels that he was threatened, then he has all the right in the world, according to you know most of the reviews I've reported on, all the right in the world to gun a creature down. Whether it's a chihuahua, an unarmed black kid, a mentally ill person, whatever. So, folks, don't expect an indictment and do expect some major, major protests and possibly riots tonight. Should be interesting on the news, and we'll keep you informed right here on 420 Radio. Coming up next, uh, speaking of racism, my uh, extra bonus radical rant for you coming up on just because marijuana prohibition is racist, it doesn't mean that legalization is racist. I'm going to address some comments by... Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness, that kind of set me on edge this weekend. We'll tiptoe around some, some minefields in the discussion of race and marijuana. When California legalized weed for so-called medical purposes. 16 years later, Washington and Colorado legalized it outright and let people sell it from storefronts. And what has been the result? Uh, the generation of millions of dollars in tax revenue for the states and creation of hundreds of new jobs in a growing multi-billion dollar industry? No. Well, yes. yes. But at what cost? Let's see. The cost of all that police time and money that's now spent going after real criminals and prisons with enough room to hold them all? No. Well, yes. But look at what it's done to the people. You mean that fewer of them are dying of alcohol, tobacco, and prescription-related causes since they've switched to cannabis, and many more are receiving medical benefit from a cheap, non-toxic healing herb? No. Well, yes. Yes. Yes to all of that. But, 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 I can smell pot from my backyard. And, and I can't tell my kids not to do it because it's illegal. And... You can get 420 Radio on the go with the Ustream video app for Android and iPhone. Go to rad-r.us slash 420 Ustream or just click the Ustream app icon for Android or iPhone below the live radio feed at 420. Hey, what's up? This is Killer Mike, one half of Run the Jewels, and I'm telling you, November 23rd through 27th, you need to be at Cannabis Cup. I did it last year, and I got so high. I can tell you what color Jesus' furniture is. I got so high, I kissed the sky twice. I got so much enlightenment, I know Buddha's last name. Do you feel what I'm telling you right now? The people are great. You don't have to search or call your sketch-ass dealer who won't call you back. You don't have to go lurking through the hood to find good smoke. You need to get out of the country. You've been sitting on your block too long smoking weed. Get out and have an adventure. See you at Cannabis Cup, November 23rd and 27th. Yeah. Cannabis Cure TV with Greg DeHoat from Sussex, England. Replaying Thursdays at 12 Pacific on 420radio.org. Hey, this is Willie Nelson for Norman. And I smoke pot and I like it a lot. I learned a long time ago that marijuana is a lot safer than alcohol. There's nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults. It's time we stopped arresting and started respecting those who smoke marijuana responsibly. To learn what you can do to help, contact Normal at NORML.org or call toll-free 888-67-NORML. You can't have- 
handle the truth. Entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. You have offended my family. Hey, this is great, man. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. I know nothing. nothing. I support a change in law. Ten federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. We don't need no stinking budget. Down the century, you have slurred the meaning of the words we, the people. Be warned, this is not your mother's marijuana. You could ask yourself a question. Do I feel lucky? Do you, punk? They want to ask you a bunch of questions. They want to have them answered immediately. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Radical rant. Just because marijuana prohibition is racist doesn't mean marijuana legalization is racist. Now, full disclosure, I am as close to being the perfectly average cisgendered straight white middle-aged middle-class married man as statistically possible. So I recognize I come to this discussion with a trunk full of privilege. But I cannot let lie a statement I read this weekend from a thinker I deeply respect, Dr. Michelle Alexander, author of the groundbreaking bestseller The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. The statement arose from a discussion held on March 6th of this year. I read it then on alternate, and it didn't sit well with me, but other than leaving a comment on the site, I don't recall bringing it up. But now, it resurfaced on my Facebook page as one of those meme photos, and it still sticks in my craw. Quote, Here are white men po poised to run big marijuana businesses, dreaming of cashing in big, big money, big businesses selling weed, after 40 years of impoverished black kids getting prison time for selling weed and their families and futures destroyed, Dr. Alexander said. Now, white men are planning to get rich doing precisely the same thing? End quote. Dr. Alexander also explained how she sees, quote, warning signs, end quote, that white men are the face of the legalization movement and the emerging pot industry. So... What, don't legalize marijuana? Don't let it be a business? Establish affirmative action priorities in licensing pot businesses? Look, there are no racial barriers to cashing in on the green rush. If there aren't enough black faces in the marijuana industry, that's an indictment of systemic racial barriers to entrepreneurship, period. If the black kids illegally selling the weed who didn't get caught saved up their profits from slinging $300 ounces, they're as welcome to get licenses and open pot shops as the white guys illegally growing the weed who so saved their money. The implication here seems to be white hypocrisy. White men punished blacks for weed selling. Now white men are ready to cash in on selling weed. Well, I recall plenty of black congressmen in the 1980s and the 1990s and the 2000s voting to support the laws that enabled mass incarceration for marijuana, Dr. Alexander. There were, and still are, plenty of black church leaders demonizing the scourge of marijuana users as vehemently as did Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan. And it was only in this decade that the major black civil rights leaders and organizations have come around to legalization, thanks in part to Dr. Alexander's book. But I also recall that the fight to legalize marijuana was founded by white men 40 years ago when there was nothing but public scorn and career suicide to be gained from it. White men who came out publicly to seek the law, of law enforcement attention that their white privilege would usually protect them from. And I know from personal experience working as a marijuana activist how I could always find eager white pot smokers ready to come out publicly to end prohibition, but I could rarely find black marijuana smokers willing to do the same. And many of those black kids selling weed that Alexander mentions were also very dedicated to maintaining their illegal profits and harming their communities instead of joining us to shape legalization in a way that profits them and benefits their communities. Not many of those weed-selling kids, 
black or white, ever picked up a clipboard to volunteer to register voters and collect petition signatures in their neighborhoods for marijuana market legalization in California, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska. There's nothing stopping Oprah Winfrey, Robert L. Johnson, or Tyler Perry from investing in the new marijuana green rush. But it's white former Microsoft executives and Yale MBAs jumping in, isn't it? Aside from somebody like Snoop Dogg and Wiz Khalifa licensing their images to future products, where's the black investment looking to help those black kids open legal pot shops and commercial grows? Diddy owns a vodka brand. Jay-Z owns a cognac brand. Why not pressure them to foster the next black drug entrepreneurs? Look, I, I completely agree that prohibition of marijuana has been enforced disproportionately against black people. I understand that disproportionality provides additional incentives for black marijuana users to remain uninvolved in public legalization and that it confuses faith leaders and civil rights leaders to mistake the harms of prohibition for the harms of marijuana itself. I'm also disappointed that legalization hasn't gone far enough in expunging criminal records and commuting prison sentences so black kids who got caught don't get to join the green rush. But that penalty applies to white kids who were caught too. The legalization of, of the marijuana market is not being implemented disproportionately in favor of white people. If anything, it reflects the disproportionate efforts of white people who fought for legalization for over four decades and the racist nature of American capitalism in general. And just on a personal note on this as well, I have found throughout my travels and now that I'm looking at the business end of the marijuana legalization, I've been to a lot of these business seminars uh, on both coasts, a bit of Florida, California, Oregon, been in Denver as well. And I'm finding now that the business part of marijuana is happening. We are experiencing a diversity boom in the marijuana movement. Really a diversity boom. I, I, I can't tell you, I know I've been in uh, Oregon normal since 2005. I've uh, been work, worked with national normal from 2008 on. I've done events in over 40 cities in 20 states. And almost always when I'd go to these events, when it was just about legalization and activism, it was almost always white people. Almost always white people, the rare Latino or Asian person or, or African American that I'd meet. But almost always white folks that were involved when there was no money to be made, when it was all just about legalization. And again, exposing yourself to law enforcement attention. But now when I'm going to these business seminars, I'm meeting all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds who are interested in getting rich in the marijuana movement. In fact, I would posit that the marijuana industries, the newly emerging green rush industries are by and large more welcoming and more diverse than the big business industries as a whole. I think that our continued state segmentization of this network of this, uh, this uh, economy, you know, because of federal prohibition, preventing the big established players from getting in, we're able to form our companies from the ground up. And a lot of these companies are found, are being founded by the people who were involved in marijuana in the first place. I'm finding many more black and brown faces, many more female faces at these business events than I ever found at just the activism events. So yes, some white folks are going to get hella rich on marijuana legalization, but there's nothing stopping some black folks and Latino folks and women and people of all diversity to get rich in this green rush. Marijuana of any of the drugs, I would say, is the one that brings the most people of the most diverse backgrounds together. And there's no reason that shouldn't be happening, and I think is happening, in the development of our marijuana legalization. Yeah, there's going to be the Jamin Shively's and the privateer holdings and these big corporate white Yale MBA type interests involved that'll make a hell of a lot of money. But there's also going to be the, the boutique growers and the closet industry and the, and the small scale 
as well that's going to open up opportunities for so many people in so many communities, more so than most industries. Well, I'm glad you like that. It's not often that I disagree with someone like Michelle Alexander, but sometimes I think in when it comes to race discussions, the oppression is kind of taken for granted and then applied in places where it doesn't really apply. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Let's talk it up in the chat room. We're back with Daily Toker Tunes and Bacon Dan right after this. 420 Radio is 24-hour marijuana. The pistachio. Green, natural, and available without prescription in all 50 states. He's fine. There's so much I worry about as a mom. Stephen Harper thinks that organized crime should continue to profit from marijuana prohibition. Imagine regulating marijuana like alcohol and cigarettes with a strong and clear educational message, making it more difficult for my kids and your kids to access. Drug dealers don't ask for ID. Stephen Harper does not have the kind of judgment we need to protect our children, authorized by the Normal Women's Alliance of Canada. Get dot buzz. Dot Buzz is the internet platform that fuels community interest, excitement, and new experiences. Dot Buzz is the premier online destination for internet users seeking the latest news on a variety of topics. Dot Buzz appeals to groups active in blogging, communications, journalism, advertising, and marketing. Dot Buzz offers registrants a stronger alternative to the shrinking namespace of existing top level domain names, such as dot com, dot net, and dot org. Get your name now at get.buzz. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Roots Monday, featuring the blues, country, folk, and jazz music that birthed the modern sounds we enjoy today. Now, sit back and enjoy your Daily Toker Tunes. All right, welcome back, everyone. Almost 23 after the hour, three minutes into the 420 break. And if you loaded your bowl properly, you should still be smoking. (laughs) We got Bacon Dan on the line, taking a break from the Apple Store to join us here on Toker Talk Radio. How you doing, Dan? I'm good. Actually, I am off today, and I am sitting with the Bills backers watching my Buffalo Bills play in Detroit right now against the New York Jets. Oh, that game's on right now? It is on right now, and Buffalo is up 7 nothing. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, say hi to the Bills backers for me, and, uh, you know, hey, you guys should have should have played that in the snow. I don't give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it should be, man. Football should be played in the snow. But, hey, um, so Bills are playing. Who are you guys playing? The Jets? The Jets, yes. And uh, uh, Michael Vick playing quarterback? Um, I think he is right now. I just got in here, so I yeah. uh, had to take a quick stop at one of our famous local dispensaries on my way to the game so understand just after the first touchdown so just just got the ball when i stepped outside and make the call understandable you know uh the dog torturer is our starting quarterback for the pigskin potheads so looking for and i think uh percy harvin's on the jets now too he's a starting receiver yep so you know i I want the bills to win for you i just want to i just want Vic and harvin to have good stat days and I tell you, moving them out of the snow and into the dome, that could help. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's they're already, I mean, the Jets are looking pretty shitty already, so it's going to be a good game. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, this weekend's a Thanksgiving weekend, Black Friday coming up, big shopping time, and that, of course, also means, and it used to mean, it used to be you could get past Thanksgiving before you started hearing Christmas music, but, you know, the, the Christmas creep, now you... November 1st, you're taking down your Halloween decorations and you're already hearing Christmas music and Bacon Dan's going to bring some of that to us. Tell us all about it. All right. Tonight we've got Wizards. I wish it could be Christmas every day. Wizard being led by Roy Wood, uh, who was a founding member of ELO. And then he went off onto his own little super artsy kind of thing. Uh, this is a classic for um, England. I mean, every when you're in England, you hear this and you hear Slade's uh, Christmas song. I mean, it's just... Standard. I love this song. 
Uh, you can see the video of this at Karaoke from Hell on one of the many random DVDs that play uh, while singing is going on. That's actually was the first time I saw the video of this. Right on. So, yeah, I think I, I think everyone's going to like it. It's just, it gets you up, gets you moving. And, hey, it's a Christmas day for me because the Bills are playing on a Monday night. That never happened. <laughs> we just went full legal. It's a win-win, baby. All right, let's get into it. This is Wizard with I Wish It Could Be Christmas Every Day.
420 Radio, the activist radio station. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, treat law enforcement with respect and stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent and I want to speak with my attorney. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at omarfigueroa.com. 420radio.org is proud to replay Weed Porn Daily with Oscar Diaz from Florida. Weed Porn Daily is dedicated to bringing you a cornucopia of content to make your sober time harder and your high time funnier. Catch the replays at 12 Pacific on Mondays on 420radio.org. Are you a hypocrite? If you live a closeted cannabis lifestyle, you are. Read about seven people living a closeted cannabis lifestyle who are on the verge of coming out in The Hypocrites by Mara K. Eaton. Available at areyouahypocrite.net. You can purchase the book on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, also available on iTunes. Check out Mara K. Eaton on Facebook as well. Learn more at areyouahypocrite.net. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> I'm having a Monday today. Welcome back. It's uh, 32 after the hour. That's music from Melvin Cheneau. It's called Serial Drama. Speaking of serial drama, we're going to go off the warpath for a second here. As you know, off the warpath, our regular segment where I discuss something other than the war on drugs. And... Uh, <laughs> Today, I got a real, real tough one to talk about, and that is, um, if you've been paying attention to the news, numerous women have come forward alleging serious sexual assault allegations against Bill Cosby. This one's this one's quite the story, man, and, and I'll just start with background and the fact that Bill Cosby is one of maybe... Four comedians, uh, let's say five, five comedians that I grew up with to the point where like I bought their vinyl LPs and, and wore them out listening to them and could recite stand up by heart to this day. I could still recite by heart. And those five comedians would be Steve Martin, Robin Williams, Richard Pryor, George Carlin, and Bill Cosby. And of those five, Bill Cosby is probably the, the, the first one, because I remember listening to those as a kid. My friend Rick, his, his folks had uh, Why Is There Air and uh, To My Brother Russell, Whom I Slept With, and all these other old Bill Cosby albums. And I remember listening to the, the, the old uh, Noah. Yeah, I wanted to build an ark, 300 cubits by 400 cubits. Right. You know, I remember that, and I remember the... Um, Buck, buck, number one, come in. I'm talking about all the kids playing buck, buck. I mean, my junior year and senior year in high school, we actually took and uh, we actually formed teams and played buck, buck. <laughs> we, we played the old Bill Cosby game, buck, buck, of all things. So when I heard these allegations, man, it just, oh, it just hurt to hear this. But it's fascinating to me. First of all, I don't doubt that the allegations are true. You know, journalism requires people to say alleged, you know, and all that. But personally, <laughs> come on now, 15 women, 16, 17, however many are, are popped up now with pretty much the same type of story of getting drugged and abused and Bill Cosby playing the, do you know who I am? I can make your career. You don't want to get in trouble if you rat on me cards for 50 years. No, no, that's some, that's some heinous shit, folks. But what's fascinating to me about this is how long it's taken these allegations to stick, to have some sort of negative effect on Bill Cosby's personal, uh, you know, his professional uh, life. TV land has pulled all the, the reruns of, of the Cosby show. Netflix has put on hold a new 
scripted series they were going to work on with Cosby. Other folks are dropping endorsement deals and so forth. But these allegations aren't new. These go back. I mean, people in, in the comedy world have heard this stuff for years. This has been a backroom kind of, you know, Cosby's a lecher kind of thing for decades now. And the public has even known about this for about 10 years. There was a, a public suit filed for Co- against Cosby. And, and I think at least three women that were going to come out and anonymously testify in this suit. But of course, it got settled and a bunch of money was paid and it went away. What's fascinating to me about this is how it has finally stuck. And the reason it has finally stuck is a comedian, a male comedian, did a riff on it the other day, the last month or whatever, Hannibal Burris, I think's his name, that went viral, talking about Bill Cosby being a serial rapist. Isn't that telling us something? That for years, for decades, women have come forward with these allegations. And it was even made public knowledge through a lawsuit and nobody paid attention to it. Is it just we could just brush it aside? But when a man brought it up, well, now it's front page news, and it's going to you know end Cosby's career in ignominy. Ignominy. I always have trouble saying that word. Isn't that fascinating? It took a man saying something about it. You know, we're learning a whole lot, especially in, you know, like I mentioned in the rant earlier today. I come from white male privilege land, right? (laughs) I'm as statistically average as you could possibly be. Straight, white, married, middle-aged, middle-class male, right? So maybe this stuff isn't new to most people, but maybe it's new to some of us. But it's amazing to me how much our perceptions and, and, and our relations between male and female, understanding of genders, the, the inclusion, the, the beginning, the, the growing acceptance of, of gay and lesbians, of transgendered people is amazing and, and long overdue. And it's fascinating as it happens to start becoming aware of how it happens. And like I said, I, I'm coming from privilege land. So maybe these like these aren't new revelations to women <laughs> or, or a lot of people, but a lot of people are coming to these things. Maybe we as a society are coming to, to reveal these things. It also reminds me of the uh, and, and this doesn't speak to sexism necessarily, but to also how these things get covered up and, and the institutions that protect uh, privileged white males. Think back to uh, Penn State and Joe Paterno, the beloved coach of Penn State, losing his job, losing his life. I mean, that was Penn State coach was his life because finally, finally covering up Jerry Sandusky raping boys couldn't be covered up anymore. There's this ad that's on the NFL now of, you know, no more, no, uh, she means yes, no more, uh, she looked okay to me, no more, it's none of my business, uh, regarding domestic violence. But for years in NFL football, and probably at the college level too, sexual assaults and actual assaults, you know, physical, I shouldn't say actual, like sexual assaults, not an assault. I mean, sexual assaults and physical assaults are covered up and routinely brushed away for important celebrities, athletes, and just white men in general sometimes. And so it's fascinating to me how we're evolving and and coming to address these issues. And it's also something that's getting addressed in the marijuana movement as well. There's been a rampant sexism in the marijuana movement for years, and that's coming to be addressed. I saw a great post on Facebook with one of the 420 nurses groups Okay, if you know the background 420 nurses, it's, you know, booth babes was kind of the evolution of it. You know, hot bikini, you know, coat nurse kind of sexy thing going on with 420. But even that's evolving now where the 420 nurses are becoming more of a uh, informational and educational group. I saw a picture posted by one of the 420 nurse groups. I think it was in Michigan. And these were just, you know, 
inspiring ladies, not selling or trading on sexuality in any way. Certainly, you know, looking as attra looking attractive, right? But not trying to sex it up. And so that's starting to change. And we're getting great outlets for female voices in the marijuana movement, like Ladybud Magazine uh, online, ladybud.com. So these things are evolving, but it really hit home to me as I was watching a discussion on this on Real Time with Bill Maher, and he had uh, uh, Seth Rogen on the panel. And Bill Maher was referring back to the movie Animal House. Now, if Bill Cosby and all those guys that I mentioned, those comedians, were like the five that I grew up with, there are also about five movies in the core of my existence. <laughs> and two of them starring John Belushi, The Blues Brothers and Animal House. And Animal House was, 1978 came out, I was 10 years old, why a 10 year old's watching Animal House, that's another discussion. But I idolized John Belushi, loved John Belushi. And uh, there's that scene in Animal House. Of course, Animal House is set in the early 60s, and the movie is in the late, you know, it was produced in the late 70s, right? And there's that scene, of course, where Pinto picks up the 13 year old girl who's the cashier at the grocery store. He doesn't know she's 13 at the time, but takes her to the frat house, gets her slot. Well, she gets sloppy drunk. To be fair, she, you know, asked to get drunk, uh, but gets sloppy drunk. And he takes her upstairs to the, 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 the room, the frat room, throws her on the bed and she's laying there in her underwear. And he's got the devil and the angel on his shoulder. And the devil's like, fuck her, fuck her, squeeze her tits, squeeze her buttons. You know, she wants it. And, and that was a funny scene. Right. That was just a funny scene. And of course, Pinto does the right thing and, you know, just puts her to bed and covers her up. Although, of course, later commits statutory rape with her in a sleeping bag on the uh, uh, football field and then takes her back home to her parents drunk as hell in a shopping cart. But I digress. But that scene where, you know, fuck her, squeak, you know, where she's passed out drunk, that was just seen as funny. And not as a, oh my God, he's trying to decide the right thing to do versus the evil thing to do. The little devil thing is like almost a joke kind of thing. And that was just perfectly acceptable to us. That was just humor. That was just comedy back then. Nobody thought of that as what sexual assault, which it, which it is. And Seth Rogen brought up the other example, 1983's Revenge of the Nerds. Not one of my top five, but another movie that was kind of formative, you know, I was a sophomore in high school at that time, Revenge of the Nerds. And it has a big script point of the hot blonde cheerleader who has the jock boyfriend, Ted McGinley, I believe played the, the jock boyfriend. Uh, and then they go into the fun house and Ted McGinley had been dressed up as Darth Vader, but then McGinley goes away and the nerd has a Darth Vader mask that he puts on and goes into the fun house and ends up uh, having sex with the hot, blonde cheerleader and then at the end of the sex he pulls off the darth vader mask and of course she's oh you were such so great in bed i really don't have any problem with the fact that you used deception to rape me because that's what that is folks that's what it is now right that's that's like you you uh uh conceal yourself or fool someone into thinking they're having sex with someone that they're not that's rape that's that's assault but that was just a throwaway fun joke back in, in the 80s, man. Uh, in our uh, chat room, Jay Maestro is like Porky's, you know, brings up Porky's. Same kind of ideas, right? Where, you know, getting a girl drunk enough to have sex with her was normal. Five of the last nine major party candidates to run for president, three of the last nine vice presidential candidates, and the last three two-term presidents have all smoked pot. Marijuana, the gateway drug to the White House. This is the Russ Belville Show. Four Twenty Radio, the home of marijuana experts. 
At Herbie's Cannabis Seeds, we pride ourselves on bringing you the best quality seeds from the world's most respected cannabis seed producers, all at the lowest online prices. You can find Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. All cannabis seeds are sold as souvenirs and as a means of preserving cannabis genetics. Herbie Seeds in no way intends to condone, promote, or incite the use of illegal or controlled substances. We strongly urge all prospective customers to check their national laws prior to placing an order. Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. Proud sponsors of the West Belleville Show. Royal Queen Seeds, we've got premium feminized cannabis seeds, including auto flowering varieties for the medical cannabis user. We've got bulk shipments available and new CBD oil. Plus, we accept payment in Visa, MasterCard, and Bitcoin, as well as other methods. Check out our website at royalqueenseeds.com for more information. We are located in the Netherlands and we have online grow experts ready to help you now at royalqueenseeds.com. He's a man that smokes that job, that job will take you for a dime. One zip he's still the life. When you smoke that killing job, it will make you very tall. It seems that Welcome back everyone, 47 after the hour, and sometimes, you know, Liebermater picks out songs. Sometimes they're apropos, sometimes they're a little scary. <laughs> This is Killin' Jive by the Cats and the Fiddle from our uh, Roots Monday New Viper Hour, old time 20th century archive. But um, Killin' Jive comes up right before I'm scheduled to talk about another off the warpath subject that isn't too far off the warpath. And that is the, I'm calling it murder, and I'm going to call it murder, of uh, Michael Brown, the uh, black young black man, 18 years old, shot in Ferguson by Officer Darren Wilson. There's some updates here in Portland, as a matter of fact. Um, in Portland, some local police officers on their Facebook pages had changed their profile icon to a Portland Police Bureau badge with a banner across it that says, I am Darren Wilson. And today the Portland Police Chief uh, publicly called on them to take that down, banned them from doing that, saying they can't speak for the department that way by using a Portland police badge. But the fact is, a lot of cops feel that way, that I am Darren Wilson. That could have been me. I could have been the one that shot the black kid and then am pestered into hiding and in fear for my family's life, etc. right? And I've got an interesting perspective on this. A couple of weekends ago, maybe it was last weekend, can't remember exactly, uh, my wife's car was at a Shade Tree Mechanics place. And the long story short of it is he screwed her over and we had to go get the car. And we figured, let's bring a cop with us if we're going to go get this car and let's record it in case anything goes down. Well, the guy wasn't there, but his stepfather was. And we got the car. And the cop, after we got the car, now we took the bus out there to go get the car, and it was quite a bus ride. After that, the cop said, hey, you guys want to ride home? Well, that's nice. Cops offering us a ride home. So my wife got in the front seat, and I rode in the back because, well, I, I have experience in the back of cop cars. And I must say that Portland police cars are nowhere near as comfortable as Utah or Idaho cop cars, since I've been in all three now. Uh, the Portland police cars are all like this plastic. It's like a... It's like a plastic bus stop bench almost. Uh, no armrests. Everything's this hard plastic, right? So anyway, I wrote in the back, and my wife has this tendency to talk to people. My wife, her mutant superpower is the superpower of small talk. She can chat anybody. It's amazing. So she starts chatting with this cop. And the cop, I got to say, the cop was a nice guy. In fact, looked a lot like me. We had the same kind of bald head and, you know, big broad shoulders and all. But uh, she started talking to this cop and asked him what he thought about passing Measure 91, that we got marijuana legalization. And he was cool about that. He's like, oh, 
We don't even care about that here in Portland. I mean, we got meth to deal with. We got gangs to deal with. We got, you know, violence and, and robberies and, and, you know, domestic disputes. No, no cop I know, none of my, uh, the cops I know has ever been called out to a domestic dispute where people were smoking pot. It's always alcohol. So he just went on and on. He's very positive about Measure 91 passing, although he, he had some of the standard reefer madness things about, oh, what about the children and, and stone drivers and so on. But all in all, listening to this cop talk about marijuana legalization was really cool. As the conversation went on, though, my wife gets to, well, what do you have? What, what's, what problems do you guys have? What, what's the issues you guys worry about? And it got to a discussion of not Michael Brown and Ferguson in particular, but here in Portland, we've had a few incidents where the cops have shot mentally ill people, killed them. And it's been high profile stuff and protests and all that. And he went into this lengthy diatribe about the mentally ill and about how sick cops are of having to deal with mentally ill people who should be in a facility, who should be getting treatment. But you can't involuntarily commit people anymore, and this is his words, because of the ACLU, that the American Civil Liberties Union fought to the point where getting someone involuntarily committed for their mental, mental health problems is damn near impossible. His words. So now, and then, and, you know, of course, Reagan closed the mental institutions. Everybody got thrown out on the street. All that history goes on beside it. But, but really, this cop was most upset with the fact that as police officers, they're the first line of dealing with the mentally ill, and then they got nowhere else to, to, to take them or put them or deal with them. And they're not really trained to deal with mental illness. They're trained to deal with, you know, threats to the public and, and to order and such. So he was upset about that. And then it led to him talking about how upset he got or gets when he talked about a, uh, this happened to a friend of mine, another officer, where he talks about it was one of the shootings. It was one of these mentally ill people who, according to the cops, you know, attacked or was belligerent or whatever and got shot, got killed. Right. And what his complaint was, this cop's complaint was the uh, in effect, and I'll, I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember exactly, but. But the effect of the gist of what he was saying was here you have all these mentally ill people whose families couldn't give a shit about them when they're out roaming the streets, when they're out getting in trouble, who did nothing to try to get them help, nothing to try to get them into treatment or, or anything. But once they get shot by the cops, every cousin, every nephew, every great aunt twice removed shows up for the protests to scream about how they're they're poor little Charlie got killed and then of course lines up for the lawsuit that makes some lawyer rich and helps them get some settlement from the, for the city when they did nothing for this guy when he was alive but now that he's dead they all show up to cash in all right <laughs> i can see that perspective but here's where i have the problem whatever happened to tasers See, we were told that tasers had to be allowed. We had to be allowed to let our cops electrocute people for a temporary period of time to avoid the use of lethal force. Oh, well, the tasers don't work on some people. The tasers, they, 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 this, there's all, all these excuses we hear for how they couldn't use the taser. So then I've got to ask, what happened to taking down a perp? I used to work at a psychiatric hospital. I worked in mental health when I was, uh, I don't know, 22, 23. I worked at the Northwest Psychiatric Hospital in, in uh, Boise, Idaho. And we actually got training on how to take down people. They were going off their meds. They were going nuts, whatever. And there, there'd be incidents. They'd act out. And this was both an adult ward and a juvenile ward. So we had like teenage kids and stuff, right? And they taught us how to do it. They'd be like, they'd get five, six of us, however many it was. All right, you're going to take right arm, you're going to take left arm, you're going to take right leg, you're going to take left leg, you're going to take the head. We'd all have our assignments. And and we took down some big fellas. I remember going in a couple of these going, holy shit, we're going to take him down? Did it just fine. Nobody ended up getting hurt. The patient was fine. We were fine. Now, I understand There's it's a closed room. Patient doesn't have any weapons. And there were five of us. 
Which is why I'm wondering why in a situation like what happened in Ferguson with Mike Brown, and, and I've been going rounds on Twitter with this, with people too, you know, the people who are kind of, uh, if not Darren Wilson defenders, they're not Mike Brown supporters who say, well, the autopsy showed that he didn't have his hands in the air. And, uh, you know, he tried to reach in the car and grab the cop's gun and it went off in there. And, and he had just gotten done at the convenience store, threatening the, the clerk at the convenience store, trying to get some blunt wraps and all that might be true. That may all very well be true. And if at the point where the cop was in the car and Mike Brown is allegedly reaching in the car to get the gun, if at that point my, the cop had shot and killed Mike Brown, that might be a little more palatable. But the fact that Mike Brown went away from the car after the shooting was away from the car and the cop got out of the car and then shot him as he was unarmed in the street and then let, left his body there for four or five hours in the street. That's where the problem exists for me. Whatever happened to calling for backup? After Mike Brown tries to grab the gun, why is that cop not staying in the car, rolling up the windows, calling for backup? What emergency was happening in that moment in the streets of Ferguson that required a cop to have to try to resolve that situation by himself with lethal force? Mike Brown didn't have a weapon. He wasn't coming after anyone else. He wasn't menacing the neighborhood. He wasn't holding a, uh, you know, he wasn't wearing a, 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 a strap on suicide vest or anything, <laughs> right? He wasn't carrying an IED or poison gas. What necessary reason was there to get out of the car, go after the kid and then shoot him? See, this is the thing. It's like, oh, people say, well, he should have obeyed the cop and he was being violent against the cop. And that, okay, may be true. But that's almost kind of like, you know, if you're trying to pull a person over for expired tags or a burnt out taillight and then they take off on a 180 mile per hour chase, you have to weigh how important it is. Is it to pull this guy over versus the fact the 180 mile per hour chase might 180 mile per hour chase might kill someone. Right. And I think there needs to be a better evaluation of when it's necessary to pull that gun in the case of cops and how necessary it is to immediately engage a suspect when you could call for backup, when there is no imminent threat, the imminent threat was if it existed, the imminent threat was when Michael Brown was up against the car and supposedly reaching in the window. There was your imminent threat. Once Michael Brown went away from that car, I don't see the reason for the cop to have to get out of the car and come at him with a gun. There still hasn't been any announcement on the grand jury not indicting. And believe me, folks, they're not going to indict. You're not going to see an indictment. As we know, if cops say they're threatened by a chihuahua, they can kill it, much less a human being. Now, you've got all these reports coming up of shops boarding up their windows in Oakland, people in Chicago protesting, all the stuff's coming in through the live blog right now. And uh, that's the only shame of this to me is businesses that have nothing to do with this, that aren't part of the problem, possibly facing damage because of riots in this situation but man this situation needs to change there is a story in the salt lake tribune pointing out that more people have been killed by police in utah than by gangs drug dealers and child abuse combined the only thing that kills more people in utah than cops is intimate partner violence Something's really got to change, folks. And the drug war has a lot to do with this. Thank you for being a part of ending it. Ending marijuana prohibition is one of the first steps necessary to end a lot of the racial disparities in this country. So thanks. You're doing important work. It's all the time we got for today. Thanks for joining us. Be back tomorrow with more news and interviews you can use for the cannabis community. For everyone here at 420radio.org, I'm Radical Russ. Until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. <laughs>